Sunday School Lesson for September the 11th, 2016. Lesson 2. We're coming from Unit 1, which is titled The Sovereignty of God. Our lesson title is The End of Oppression. Our devotion reading is taken from 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, verses 1 through 11. Our background scripture is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25. And our printed passage is from Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 10a. Our key verse, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from, all, from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. Our, our lesson name as a result of studying this lesson that the students should understand that God acts in the best interest of all peoples and all nations. Should appreciate that God removes barriers that cause people to feel separated from God and one another and to rejoice that God gives hope to all oppressed people. The end of oppression. Chapters 24 through 27 of the book of Isaiah has been designated as Isaiah's Apopolistics, looking towards the end times. Chapter 24 speaks of the great tribulation, which is God's judgment in the future upon the whole earth. Chapters 25 through 27 brings us to the kingdom age, which is the reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. After the Lord Jesus come and ends the tribulation, he established his kingdom on earth. This has been predicted throughout the Old Testament. The king is coming. There will be the kingdom of heaven upon this earth. John the Baptist, when he started his ministry, he said, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus started his ministry, he said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But the Jews rejected their king. And so he went from the kingdom of Israel to form his church. And so now, now we are speaking of the king's return to the earth at the close of the tribulation. For we find written in the book of Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 29 and 30, where it states, Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Matthew 25, 31 through 20, 34 states, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separate the sheep from the goat. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
This 25th chapter is a song of those delivered out of the great tribulation in the future kingdom of Christ here on earth. It is the song of three standards. The, the first standard is praise to God for deliverance from all enemies. The second standard is is praise to God for provision of present needs. And the third stanza is praise to God in anticipation of future joy. Our lesson today is from the second stanza, starting in verse 6, and it reads, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts Make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on leech, and of fat things full of marrow, a wine on leech well refined. In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast. In this mountain is, is in Mount Zion, that is in Jerusalem. This speaks of the Messiah, the Messiah, and that his kingdom will commence and be seated in Jerusalem and then extended to all nations. Also, it speaks of how the Lord will provide for all people the provision of salvation, not only to the Jews, but to people everywhere. A feast. A feast is emblematic of a occasion of joy. Here it is used in the twofold sense of an occasion of joy and of an abundance of provisions for the necessity of those who should be entertained. This feast will be prepared on Mount Zion, made in Jerusalem by the Messiah for the spiritual needs of the whole world. It's also said a feast of fat things, which is emblematic of the abundance provision of divine mercy, that God is plentiful in mercy. Verse 7 of our lesson says, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering. When the kingdom established and the Lord comes, the world will be free. From that darkness of ignorance, the covering with which all people are covered. They are blind. They, they, they are blinded. There's the veil over them, put over them by Satan where, where he had blinded them, blocking their visions today from even seeing the truth. There is a veil spread over all nations, for they all sit in darkness. And no wonder. When the Jews themselves, among whom God was known, that he had revealed himself to them as a people in a special way, that they even had a veil upon their hearts. But this veil, the Lord will destroy. He will open up the spiritual eyes where that we might see because the world as now, they walk in darkness. It is a veil over man's heart and it is a veil in a sense which covers his faith from him seeing the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we find that also in this kingdom, in verse 8 says that he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall be shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord has spoken it. 
he will swallow up death in victory. This is to be understood not of a spiritual death, which is swallowed up in, in conversion when, when an individual accepts the Lord Jesus Christ, nor of the conversion of the Jews, which would be like them coming as life from death. But it speaks of a corporal death. This corporal, this penalty for the wages of sin, Jesus Christ swallowed that up in victory by dying on the cross, both with respect to himself, who will never die again, and is chiefly, speaks of the resurrection state of the people coming of Christ, the personal coming of Christ. When the dead in him shall rise first and shall never die again. That, that there will be no more death, neither corporal or spiritual. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. You know, in this life, there are many things now that causes tears to fall from one's face. The mourning, the, the grief over our own sins, the grief over in dwelling sins unbelief, carnality, leanness, backslide, and the sins of others, the temptations of Satan, and the afflictions of various sorts, and the persecution of men. These cause grief. This cause heartaches. So many tears are shed. But in the kingdom, these will be no more. Why? Because God is said to have wiped them all away. That the Lord Jesus Christ, he will be reigning from his throne in Jerusalem. And the Bible says that he will be reigning in righteousness. That, that the end of oppression will be over and that he will... He would reign with a rod of iron. He he would reign by not by what he can't you can't bribe him. He is no favoritism, but he will reign in righteousness where all mankind, regardless of race, creed, economical status, or or, 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 or caste system, that we all will be treated right and righteous by the righteous King. It says that, that God, it says, to wipe them away. All the reproaches and calamities and all the misrepresentation mis of God's people shall be taken away from them everywhere. All false charges, accusations, all persecution shall now stop. The Jews have been persecuted all throughout history. They have been blamed for for the calamities we we, we have seen since the time that when seventy AD when, when they was driven out of Jerusalem. Wherever they have they have gone, they they have been persecuted. They've been they they've been called Christ killers and they even during the World War Two, many of us were, know about what history teaches about the the Holocaust where they killed over six million Jews. Even in the even in the Spanish Inquisition during the Dark Ages where they persecuted Jews. But God says that in his word that one day when the king of the Jews returned that that this persecution will be over because all persecution will stop. There shall be none that hurt them in that 
holy mountain. Isaiah 11 and 9 states, They shall no more hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the sea. It gonna be it gonna come a time where the knowledge of the Lord will cover the whole earth, where where people will know him, his will, and be willing to follow him. And so with the knowledge of the Lord that there will be righteousness, that that people will walk according to the way the the Lord wants us to walk, that they will walk in light and not in darkness. We find in verse 9, 10 of our lesson where it states, And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. And it shall be said in that day, when the feast will be made for all the Lord's people, when the veil and covering shall be removed, when death will be swallowed up, in victory, when all tears shall be wiped away from the saints, when their rebuke shall be taken away from them, all which will be at the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. Lo, this is our God, and and not the idols of the Gentiles or. Or, or man's imagination, the, or the worship of a material thing, or the, the works of our hands. But Christ of Jesus, who is God over all and blessed forever, Emmanuel, God with us. The, the, the phrase is expressive of his true and proper deity of faith, of interest in him, and of joy, the joy of it. It says that we have waited for him, and he will save us. As the Old Testament saints waited for his first coming, where they were looking for Messiah to come, and for his salvation, believing that he would be the author of it. They was looking for him to come. John the Baptist, when he seen Jesus as the Baptist, he said, are, are you the one? He, he, sent, he sent his disciples to, to Jesus when he was in prison. And, and he asked him, are you the one or should we look for another? For they had been looking for the Messiah to come. They had been looking for him to come for his salvation, to deliver them, to deliver them. But they was looking for a, a earthly kingdom. But they didn't realize that, first of all, that they had to be delivered from sin before the earthly kingdom would come. That Christ came to deliver them from the wages and the penalty of sin. And so, and so with that, so the New Testament saints, we as Christians, the New Testament saints, we are waiting for his second coming. And for us that look for him and expect his glorious appearance. And we who are waiting, we should have our lawns girded. And we should have our lights trim and burning and we should wait for our Lord's coming for he will appear a second time without sin unto salvation to put us into the 
possession of the salvation he has attained for us, for which we are heirs and is nearer than when we first believed. Salvation is in three tenths. First of all, Jesus has the saints for the saints. He has delivered us from the penalty of sin. Secondly, tense of salvation that we are being delivered from the habit and dominion of sin in our everyday life. And then thirdly, when he comes, we're looking for his second coming where we can meet him in the air where we will be delivered from the very presence of sin. And so this is the Lord. We have waiting for him. We should be waiting for him, looking and longing and in hasten to the, to the day of his coming. Colossians 3rd chapter say, If we did then be reason, risen with Christ, that we should set our affection on things above and not on this earth. That Christ is our life. So we should have a longing to to do what? To look for him. To be ready. To yearn to go and to be with the Lord. And it, and it talks about how that we as the living saints, we, we're going to be changed. We're going to be caught up to meet him. And upon meeting him, thus shall we greet him and one another. This is his glorious day. Are we waiting for the Lord? And that talks about how that we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So full and complete and perfect and so much for the glory of God, which was wrought out by him before and now possessed by him that this is what is called the joy of their Lord. They now enter into. The Lord has provided a place for us. He says, he told us in John the 14th chapter that he's going away to prepare a place for us. And if he go away that he will come again and receive us unto himself, that that where he is, we may be also. The joy of the Lord. To not in material things, but the joy to have peace. Christ, who is our peace? He should be our joy. Realizing that all oppression from that that one day that our Savior is coming back. That that right now, though there are tears shed upon this earth, but we have something to look forward. It's the song says, This joy I have. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. This joy that we have, knowing that he said that he would never leave us, or forsake us, that he would be with us even until the end of the earth. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is faithful, and not only that he's he's faithful, but but he's omnipotent. He's very God manifested in the flesh. And so that he is faithful, he is truthful, and then and then not only that, but he has the power to do the things that he had promise to do for us. So this is a beautiful lesson that that this should be a lesson that 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 we should rejoice about having the joy of knowing that one day that that our Lord, our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ is coming back for us. May the Lord bless you and keep you.